to this video lecture series for Introduction to Philosophy. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of the desirability of immortality. And that just is the question of, would it make sense for you to want to live forever, to never die, or live an eternal life? Is there any sort of life that you think would be so satisfying and so fulfilling that you would want it to go on forever? This is the question of whether immortality is desirable. In our last video, we outlined one argument against the desirability of, of immortality. It's an argument that claimed that although it may be a very bad thing that you die when you do, although it may be a bad thing that death deprives you of many years you could use productively and in a fulfilling manner, that ultimately it is a good thing that our lives come to an end because, in fact, immortality would not be a sort of paradise or a pleasant existence it might be a sort of unbearable hell. Now what is that argument? So let's recall to ourselves what the argument is. Last time I called it the uh, immortality dilemma argument. And it simply states this. First, if you're an immortal being, then your categorical desires will either change over time or they won't change. So remember, a categorical desire is the sort of desire you have which gives you a reason to continue existing, a reason to continue living. A lot of our desires for food and shelter and things of that nature, we want if we are alive, right? If we are alive, we want to be well fed and we want to be clothed and have shelter. But if we're dead, we don't think it's some horrible tragedy that we're no longer going to have clothes. We don't need those anymore. But a categorical desire is something you would want to come to fruition to be satisfied even if you were dead. And therefore, it gives you a reason to keep living, to keep striving after that desire. So, for instance, a desire that your children do well, a desire to fight for a just cause, a desire to make a scientific breakthrough through a discovery which will help humanity. These are things that you want to come about even if you die before they ultimately do come about. And because you want them to come about, they give you a reason to continue living in order to pursue those goals. So our categorical desires really are those desires that form the foundation of who we are, what we value, and what we think is most important in life. So the first premise just says we have two options. Either those desires, the categorical desires we have, are either not going to change, they'll remain the same, or they will change over time. In our previous video, we considered P2. We considered the idea that, well, if those categorical desires do not change over time, then the claim is that an immortal existence would actually be worse than death. And why is that? So if you imagine living the same life with the same values, the same commitments, the same desires for an eternal amount of time, that means you're more or less pursuing the same set of projects. You're pursuing the same goals for 100 years, 200 years, 1,000, a million, a billion, a trillion years, multiple trillions of years. And no matter how engrossing, no matter how engaging, no matter how important you think some desire is, it'd be very difficult to imagine that you could live an existence like that and not experience anything except horrible and interminable boredom. And the claim in P2 is that that boredom is so bad that you would actually be better off at some point uh, dying. You would be better off having your life end than continue to live in that state of utter boredom. But of course, this still leaves the other possibility. You might say, well, yeah, I agree with that claim, right? I wouldn't want to live a life where I was only interested in the same basic things for all of eternity. But why can't I just imagine a life where my desires will change? And this doesn't seem that implausible. I mean, our desires for certain things change all the time, right? The things you liked when you're younger, you may not like when you're older, etc., right? So why can't we just imagine that we live an eternal life and we... Um, pursue many different uh, projects, many different goals. We have many different categorical desires, and those categorical desires change. And Kagan himself, in his chapter on immortality, he considers this possibility. He's like, well, how can we solve this boredom problem? Well, he proposes a couple things. He says, what's the solution for that? Perhaps a special kind of amnesia, constantly rolling progressive loss of memory. So here I am, 100 years old, 1,000, 50,000 years old. I'm getting pretty bored with life. But now we introduce some progressive memory loss so I no longer remember what I did 10,000 years earlier. By the time I'm a million, I no longer remember what I was doing when I, when I was a lad of a mere 500,000 years and etc. So first thing he says, well, we can imagine that 
over time you simply forget what your life was like previously so it sort of takes the edge off some of that boredom that you have been um, you know building up for the last 500,000 years but he says that's might, might not be enough right he says also and maybe for our purposes more importantly while we're at it why not overhaul your interest desires and taste as well let's have your taste and interest change gradually but radically over the years and the important thing to realize is that if you imagine that you're going to live an immortal life, and if you allow even the smallest but consistent changes to your personality, then over the years you will be a radically, radically, fundamentally different person than you are now. So imagine you just say, well, okay, um, you know, every year my personality will change just ever so slightly. The things I care about, my values, uh, my tastes, the things I desire, is just going to change ever so slightly. Okay, so every year it changes ever so slightly. So what are you going to look like in a thousand years, a hundred thousand, a billion, a trillion years? Well, very small changes that build up over vast expanses of time will bring out radical changes. And the very important thing to realize about this is the following. So that if we imagine, for instance, that you had the choice, there's a genie that comes down and says, do you want to live a normal human life where you, you, you hopefully get old and die? Or do you want to live forever? If you tell the genie that I would like to live forever, that means you're committing yourself to eventually being a completely and fundamentally and radically transformed person than you are now and doing that many, many, many times over. So the main thing I want to actually think about this video is if we do that, do we lose anything? If we make a choice that we know will bring out radical fundamental changes to who we are, have we lost something important about ourselves? And whatever it is we might lose about, our, about ourselves, how important is that? How critical is that? Is it worth um, sacrificing that for the sake of a longer life? So we're really asking the question, ultimately, how important is it that I sort of retain a stable core and sense of identity over who I am? Now, in order to get at this question, I want to look at a real-life example um, that has to do with memory loss. It has to do with a sort of sense of loss of identity. And it's a case of a woman who is named Sue Mack. And I have a description here, but I want to just play a short video where um, there was a profile done um, on her by CBS, and they did some interviewing with her. I'm going to show this short clip and say a few things about it. Sue Mack takes on in her new book, I Forgot to Remember, A Memoir of Amnesia. It goes on sale today, and it's published by Simon & Schuster, a division of CBS. And CBS This Morning contributor Lee Woodruff sat down with Mac Lee. Good morning. Good morning, Nora. Doctors will tell you that having complete, lasting amnesia is very rare. But it happened to Sue Mack after she suffered a blow to the head. And while she lost all of her memories, she learned just what it takes to rebuild your life from scratch. Watching Sue Mech cook with her family, there's nothing in particular that would strike you as different about the 48-year-old. Yet just the fact that she is standing here in her kitchen is remarkable. If I had told both of you 20 years ago that you would be standing in the kitchen, making sauce together, hanging out, would you have believed me? I think you were smoking crack. In 1988, Jim and Sue Mech were the young, energetic parents of two little boys. They were just beginning to build their lives in Texas when a freak accident changed everything. My nine-month-old son crawled up to me and I picked him up like you would a baby, you know, you know, hey baby. Um, and he, his back or feet or bottom or something hit, must have hit the ceiling fan. It lifted it just enough to lift it off the hook and it came crashing down. That was the end of Sue Mech, part one. <laughs> and the beginning of Sue Mech, part two. She'd suffered a traumatic brain injury that wiped out every bit of her memory. She didn't know her husband or recognize her children. She was a clean slate at the age of 22. Benjamin was just two and Patrick was 10 months at that point. 
I didn't know what I was supposed to do, and I don't know what I did. But Sue, in many ways now a child herself, had to raise her boys often alone, as Jim's job frequently took him on the road. He would come home sometimes and the car would be running in the driveway, or the kids would be in the backyard and I was nowhere to be found, or I was around and the kids were nowhere to be found. She was living in a fog, just trying to get through each day. In 1992, the couple had a third child, Cassidy, who became as much a sister as she was a daughter. I think that I, a lot of times, am a voice for my mom in certain situations. We've always very much like been a team. It's not normal that your kids come home from school and tell you what they learned that day so you can learn something. And Benjamin started doing that as soon as he went to school. He would come home and tell me what he learned. And that's what I learned with him. Today, Sue is pursuing a dream to finish her education. She's in her final semester at Smith College, where she works in the library and sings in the glee club. She's never recovered any of those lost memories, but Sue doesn't mourn what she doesn't miss. She just creates new ones. You wrote a lot about coming back to yourself in the long recovery process. Do you feel whole now? Does anybody ever feel whole? <laughs> um, writing the book certainly added pieces to the puzzle that is my life that I will always have. I've learned so much about myself and each one of those stories is just a few more pieces in the puzzle. Okay, so the case of Sumac brings up a number of interesting issues, but for our point of view, in terms of the question of immortality and in terms of thinking philosophically about that issue, the main issue really has to do with survival. And you'll remember that uh, we previously talked about the concept of survival when we covered Plato's Phaedo, and the idea just is, um, when we're asking about survival, we're saying some event occurs, and after that event, ha does the person remain? Do they still exist? Have they survived? Or have they not survived? And in cases like this, it brings up a lot of thorny or tricky questions because we can say the event in question is this uh, accident that, that, that Sumek experienced. And so we have two uh, Sumeks, right? There's Sumek prior to the accident in 1988. And there's Sumek after the accident, for instance, in 2011 when she received her associate's, uh, uh, when she received her associate's degree. And the question we have to ask is, did Sumek 1 survive that accident? Is Sumek 2 the same person as Sumek 1? Or is Sumek a new person altogether? And look, it's tempting to say, of course, that they're the same person because there's, certain, there's of course, certain similarities. They're sharing the same body, for instance, and that's not necessarily a trivial thing. But think about some other factors as well. For instance, the way Sue Mech herself talks about her past is as if she's talking about another person. When she's describing what happened in the accident and what happened in the past, in her past life, these are all things that other people have told her. She has no memories of these things from a first person point of view. And so from that perspective, it's very much like someone else telling her about another person from the past. Also think about um, the way Sumek's husband actually, in, in one case, answered when asked um, whether after the accident she was the same person or not. Sumek's husband said, it was Sue 2.0. She had rebooted. It was literally like she had died. Her personality was gone. So in his view, at least, right, you might, and you can pose all sorts of odd questions here, you might say from his point of view, he was on his second wife at that point that he was a widower, that unfortunately his first wife had died, and now he is married to a different person. And so the question that this brings up for us is, remember, we're thinking about a sort of situation in which, okay, you can live an immortal life. However, that immortal life is one in which you will undergo radical transformation. And if you're at all sympathetic to the idea that the radical transformation that Sumek underwent here fundamentally changed who she was as a person. It might have led to a situation in which her previous self had died and a new person or new self was born. If you're all sympathetic to that view, 
then you really start to think about, okay, if I'm going to live an immortal life, and I know that my immortal life will produce radical changes in who I am, then you can really ask the question, can I survive immortality? A thousand years from now, a hundred thousand years from now, a million or billion or trillion years from now, will it be that I will be a radically different person? Or will it be that I will no longer exist and some other person will be using my body? Now, it's interesting. Kagan seems, um, as we're going to see, to be somewhat sympathetic to this. And to get our minds around the idea of why this is, we should think a little more clearly or a little more carefully about what it is that we want out of survival. Right, so you all, we would all say, yeah, of course we want, to, we want to survive into the future, right? And if there was a horrible accident that occurred that was life-threatening, you would say, I want to survive that accident. But the question is, from a philosophical point of view, how do you know that you have survived? What is it that you want from the future? What do you want to be there to be in the future? Because look, we know there's going to be people in the future, but it doesn't really matter, right, if those people aren't us. So what is it that we want from our survival? And we might point to two things. There's probably more than this, but there's maybe at least these two. One, what matters to us is identity. We want it to be possible that in the future, when we survive into the future, we can point to some individual and say, that person is me. Okay, that's one thing we want. But there's a second thing we might want as well. You might say it's not only important that there is some individual in the future that will be me, but we might say that it's important to me that this person shares to some extent my fundamental values, my commitments, and maybe even the categorical desires that make us who we are. And I'm calling this integrity because if you think about it, to be a person with integrity means to have a sort of core of commitments or values that you're just not willing to sacrifice. That you think are so important, perhaps, that you might even be willing to put your life on the line for them. And if you think it matters to be the sort of person with those values and commitments that make you who you are, then we might say what, what we also want out of our survival is not to have to sacrifice or get rid of those commitments. Again, put yourself in the, in the shoes of Sumek-1. You can imagine if Sumek-1 could sort of examine the situation from, from a third-person po point of view, she might say, okay, maybe I can sort of identify this later Sumek after the accident as me, but it's not a me that I fundamentally care about because that person cares about very different things, is living a very different life, has very different desires, and doesn't even remember being me in the first place. And if you think about how integral memory is to your sense of who you are, there's a real sense in which you might say, if this future person, you're telling me that they're me in some abstract sense, but they don't remember me and they don't share my values, then I haven't really gotten what I want out of survival. I haven't gotten what I want out of a continued existence. And as it turns out, this is very important in terms of immortality, and Kagan makes this point. So he says, look, you tell me you're offering me an immortal existence where my desires will change. And so the person tells him, there's going to be someone alive. He'll be you, but he will be completely unlike you. He will have different tastes, no memories of having taught philosophy, no interest in philosophy or politics or folk music, no concern for your family, and so forth and so on. I say, that's all rather interesting from a metaphysical point of view. But speaking personally, I don't really care. It's not of interest to me to survive per se, and merely repeating the mantra, oh, but it's me, doesn't make it more desirable to me. The problem here is that if we go far enough out, then the person who is supposed to be me is no longer sufficiently like me. I don't really care that there will still be someone out there who is me if they are so utterly unlike the way I am now. But that, I hope you see, is just what we've ended up describing with our little story of eternal life made palatable through progressive memory loss and radical changes in interests, goals, and desires. If the only way in which you can 
can have an immortal life is one where you will undergo radical change, then it might end up producing a future existence that you don't identify with and you don't care about. Now, there's another way to think about this well, specifically in terms of this idea of integrity, because there's sort of a, maybe a moral value at, at work here. So in a well-known article on integrity by a philosopher named Lynn McFall, she makes the following statements, the following claims that she thinks characterizes a person we would say has integrity. Right, so for instance, she says, one may die for beauty, truth, justice, the objection might continue, but not for mantrache. Wine is not that important. So what's the, what's the point of this? She says, well, a person with integrity is committed to something, and they're not just committed to anything. They're not just committed to cheese sandwiches or wine. They're committed to some fundamental important value, to beauty, truth, or justice. So imagine, for instance, that the future iteration of yourself, which is so radically changed, like let's say what makes, what makes you who you are is your fundamental commitment to a cause for justice. And you know that a thousand or million years from now, the person who is supposed to be you won't care about that at all. That'll be a completely irrelevant concern to them. Well, you might say, well, wait a minute. Yes, I've <laughs> gained eternal life, but I've only been able to do it by sacrificing who I am and sacrificing what's most important to me. This commitment to justice that I had. McFall also says that an attitude essential to the notion of integrity is that there are some things that one is not prepared to do or some things that one must do. Now, we can think about this also in terms of Socrates, right? So we saw Socrates in the Apology say that even on the pain of death, he would not stop engaging in philosophy. And we can see a similar thing going on here. If you have some fundamental commitment that makes you who you are, and you say, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice that commitment in return for an immortal life. I'm going to live a life that I know eventually will cause me to lose interest and not have this commitment anymore. Then did you have a real commitment to that in the first place? Did you truly have the integrity to stand by your convictions? Because to have integrity means that there are some things that you will not do. Socrates said he will not appease the jury by stopping philosophy, even if it leads to his death. If you're truly committed to some cause of justice or truth or beauty, scientific discovery, artistic excellence, if you're committed to any of those things, then we might say, well, how could you just throw that commitment away for the sake of an eternal life? And the importance of all this in McFall's view is that these, the sets of principles or commitments that make us who we are, they're the most fundamental commitments that we can have and they determine for us what counts as a reason to do something. If you're really committed to a cause, you say, well, what, the way I live my life is oriented toward bringing that about. It gives me a reason to get up in the morning. It gives me a reason to act. It gives me a re It orients my entire life. And so if you think integrity is important, then you really have to ask yourself the question, would it make sense to sacrifice those commitments and goals and categorical desires that make you who you are for the sake of, of longer life, even if it brought about more pleasure. And so Kagan sums up the argument. He says, well, look, um, he says we can put the point in the form of a dilemma, right? So on the one hand, if we make the immortal person be similar to me, then the horrible boredom will set in, right? If if you have to be locked into how you are now and pursue that for thousands and millions and trillions of years, then you're going to be incredibly bored. On the other hand, if we solve the problem of boredom with progressive memory loss and radical personality changes, then maybe I won't be bored, but that isn't going to be a life I especially want for myself. It won't be a life that matters to you. It will be a life where you sacrificed your integrity. And so for this reason, P3 claims that such a life would be just as bad as death because in a sense, you fundamentally would have died. And so the final conclusion of the argument says, immortality would be either worse than death or just as bad as death. Now I want to end by making one final comment on the concept of a categorical desire. Because what, you know, I've been drawing both on Kagan's chapter and also Bernard Williams' article, and one of the 
points that Bernard Williams makes about categorical desires is that these are the desires that give us a reason to live, and as such, they give a meaning or purpose to our life. And so if we take this idea seriously, then we get an explanation of a lot of things. One, we get another explanation of what makes our death bad for us. Our death is bad because it doesn't enable us to satisfy our categorical desires. Our death is bad because it prevents us from pursuing our most important projects. And so unlike the Epicurean view of desire, where desire is just something that's sort of annoying, right? When you have an unfulfilled desire, it causes you mental irritation, it causes you mental turbulence, it doesn't let you, it doesn't let you achieve ataraxia, and so you're in this sort of um, unsettled state. So the reason we, sa we satisfy desire is just to get rid of that. But no, William says, the reason we satisfy our most important desires is because they give a meaning and purpose and shape to our life. They give us a reason to live in the first place. So he thinks that is the better explanation of what makes death bad. It's also the better explanation of what makes life meaningful. And it is fundamentally the explanation for why it is a good thing we die, even if it's not a good thing that we die when we do. It very well, and I think very likely is the case, that we could all benefit from more life. But the prospect of any more of an eternal life, where we're either very bored or fundamentally radically changed as persons, may not be so attractive. So I will cut this video there. Uh, I hope as always it was helpful and useful, and I will see you in the next video.